tonight. As you know, I often feature a tribute to someone that has influenced my life and the lives of others in a very positive way. I do these tributes in the hopes of encouraging our young adults and youth to learn and contribute to society. And as you know, I don't always use examples of people who've gone to college. Tonight we have uh, four examples of uh, college graduates and one example uh, a person who I don't think did go to college but became uh, very famous. Tonight you'll be seeing first a picture of Franz Opper. When hearing about the Bernie Madoff 50 billion security scam and other recent se securities scams. There was a new one announced yesterday, a 10 million one from a guy in Houston. And when the recent economic worldwide crisis occurred due partially to a lack of regulation and enforcement in the financial industry, including the lack of adequate procedures, enforcement, and oversight by the Treasury, Federal Reserve, the Fed, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and Congress. I immediately thought, what would Franz Opper's reaction be? Franz Opper was a friend and fellow native of Torrington, Connecticut, and a summer resident for many years at Highland Lake during his youth. His father, a doctor, uh, had a cottage on East Wakefield Boulevard, off of East Wakefield Boulevard, and Franz spent uh, summers here with his two brothers and a sister and uh, he learned, he, he had a lot of friends, not only in Torrington, but he had many friends in Winstead that he kept throughout his life. During the Depression, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, was established by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to provide regulation and oversight to the securities industry. He chose Joseph P. Kennedy to head the SEC because Kennedy knew how the system worked and how it could be improved to protect the public and the systems themselves. FDR is quoted as using stronger language, but I am being kind here. It appears that regulation and oversight at the SEC may have deteriorated over time, deteriorated over time, and may need attention and improvement once again. 
Franz was a very intelligent person. He was a graduate of Hotchkiss, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and the University of Pennsylvania Law School in Philadelphia, PA. At the age of 39, this local summer resident was placed into the who's who in America. As an attorney, Franz was employed by the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C. in a regulatory and oversight capacity. Later, he was employed as staff attorney, uh, attorney to the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Finance, where he was a principal drafter of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which made it against the law for the U.S. corporations to bribe foreign officials. When I was traveling the world on business, I would often have discussions with Franz about this practice. In both capacities, it was Franz's responsibility, amongst others, to understand the SEC's rules and regulations and keep an eye on business to ensure that the rules and regulations were being followed. As an enforcement attorney at the SEC, he and his colleagues loved the idea that they were using their skills and legal training to protect consumers, including widows and orphans, from unscrupulous acts by members of the investment community. That would include brokers and dealers, all the way up to and including the likes of Bernie Madoff. I had many friends beginning their careers in Washington, D.C. when I worked at NASA Goddard for Litton Industries on the NASA ground communication system. One of them was Franz. Later, when I was living overseas and I passed through Washington on business, I would invite my friends out to dinner for old time's sake. When Franz was in attendance, he would see me reach for the check at the end of the evening and immediately ask, who is paying for this tab? You or the company that you represent? I would say, I'm host and I'm paying as a friend. Franz was an encyclopedia of the SEC rules and regulations and liked to see them followed. Seeing that they were followed was a big part of his job at the House of Representatives. I always remember the example set by Franz on many occasions, and these remembrances have helped me all through my business career. I was often hired by major corporations in difficult and challenging situations to assume very heavy responsibilities and to set a pristine financial example for others to follow. Not accepting anything from vendors that were trying to ingratiate them themselves with the company uh, was very important. If a vendor offered tickets to the World Series or Super Bowl, I'd say no. If they sent me gift baskets, fruit, flowers, candy, anything you can imagine, golf balls, etc., I'd send them back to the amazement of their salesmen. I was once reviewed by the chairman of uh, one of the telephone companies in New York when I worked there. And uh, he said, Brian, he said, we reviewed your background due to some complaints by uh, people in the company, and uh, you passed with flying colors. I've also been investigated everywhere for high security clearances, for uh, working down at the IRS, et cetera. And I thank Franz for uh, setting a good example for, uh, for businessmen and relating those ideas to me. Many years ago, Franz was diagnosed with ALS amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or as it's now known more properly as Lou Gehrig's disease. Franz was not a quitter. Franz was very brave while progressing through this long convalescence for many reasons, one of which was that he wanted to see his two children grow up for as long as he was able. In Torrington, Connecticut, when we were growing up, most baseball fans were divided into f two factions, the New York Yankee fans and the Boston Red Sox fans. It was quite an interesting rivalry at the time with Ted Williams on one team and Joe DiMaggio on the other. Very 
exciting. Franz was a vocal and avid Red Sox fan throughout his life. When Franz was attending the Yale University, he met Bart Giamatti, you should see his picture up on the uh, screen, who eventually became Commissioner of Baseball. And while Franz was at Hotchkiss, a fellow classmate was Faye Vincent Jr., the son of another Torrington native and athlete, now a member of the Torrington High School Athletic Hall of Fame. His name was, G uh, his father's name was also Faye Vincent. The younger Vincent eventually became Giamatti's Deputy Commissioner of Baseball and eventually Commissioner of Baseball upon the death of Bart Giamatti. Franz was born on the very same day that baseball great Lou Gehrig made his famous goodbye speech at Yankee Stadium. You should see a picture of Lou Gehrig there on the day that he made the speech. In that speech, Gehrig declared himself the luckiest man in the world, even though he was saying goodbye to baseball because he'd been stricken with ALS, now commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Franz's brother contacted Faye Vincent to see if there might be some way that the Boston Red Sox might be able to send Franz some birthday wishes on his 50th birthday. Unbeknownst to Franz's brother, Vincent and baseball were planning a 50th anniversary, anniversary commemoration of Lou Gehrig's famous speech. So when Vincent got the call, he said he would do Franz's birthday celebration even one better. The Red Sox and Yankees were playing a game on July 4th, 1989 at Yankee Stadium, and Lou Gehrig's famous speech was to be replayed as a way to raise public awareness of the disease. So for that day, well into the latter stages of Franz's illness, Vincent invited Franz and his family to be guests at the Yankee Stadium to occupy Yankee owner George Steinbrenner's box, and Vincent arranged their transportation. Franz and his family made the trip to Yankee Stadium, Franz in a military medical helicopter. In a, I guess a medical helicopter, I'm not sure it was military. Using a special communication device for recording his thoughts, Franz wrote a beautiful speech for the occasion by blinking his eyes into a computer. His daughter Gretchen, who, who was 18 years old at the time, was to read the speech at home play, but at the last minute the microphone didn't work as she was standing at home plate with a famous New York Yankee announcer, Mel Allen. The Associated Press reporter was present and asked for a copy of the intended address and published the paper nationwide. If you're interested in reading the paper, you can Google Franz Opper to see some of the press history of the event. Franz always set a wonderful and excellent example for others to follow. He must be looking down now at the current state of the financial industry and SEC and reminding them of their regulatory and oversight improvement for businesses as he did to me from time to time. Thanks, Franz. I wish that you were still here because things wouldn't have gotten so bad in my opinion, if you could have remained active. See you again soon. Now you will see a picture of Franz's wife, Barbara Negri Opper, who is also from Torrington, Connecticut, lived on Spring Street uh, up off Highland Avenue most of her, um, uh, during most of her uh, youth in town. Thanks to another Torrington native, Barbara Negri Opper, Franz's wife, for helping me with this tribute to Franz. Barbara, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Connecticut College, 
a master's degree in economics from the University of Michigan, is also a very exceptional person who has contributed a great deal to the financial world over the years in her own right as a senior manager at the World Bank in charge of financial policy and risk management, an advisor and executive at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and a senior economist to the Board of Governors of the Res Federal Reserve System, amongst other things. Now retired, Barbara is an economic consultant to various countries around the world. When I was in Washington, D.C., working as a consultant at the IRS at the turn of the century, at, at the request of Commissioner Charles Rosati, I asked Barbara why she joined the World Bank and she said that she joined for many professional reasons and also to earn the insurance coverage that she needed to help Franz during his long, difficult, and expensive illness. Thank you, Barbara. Now, folks, how's that for a contribution? Franz and Barbara sure contributed a lot to our society and are a perfect example for others to follow. I think that Lou Gehrig probably didn't go to college, but he's a very, very, uh, very, very well-respected uh, baseball player and human being, and movies have been made about him, books are written about him, I find a lot of information, on again, on the Internet. And uh, here we have a, a fellow from Torrington who ended up being baseball commissioner, Babe Vincent Jr., and uh, speaks a lot for this area. So with that, the end of my comments for this evening. We'll get on to the agenda for the rest of the program. Agenda on February 19, 2009. I've already read the comments. Um, the Penguin Plunge, i got to put a correction in for that because the last time I made a mistake. But before I do that, I think I want to just go, I'm, I meant to do this first. <laughs> Sometimes you get carried away here. But to donate to um, ALS or Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease, as it's known more commonly, research, contact Team TDI at ALS.net. If you want to donate some money or find out more about the disease, give them a, a, a contact on the Internet or phone them, 617, Boston area code, 441 -7200. They have many walks around the world to support this disease, and my own view is that sooner or later there'll be a fix for this because they are using computers and more and more to help the brain and uh, to do many, many things that, uh, that we couldn't do before. So we're moving on, and if you want to contribute and be of help or even march in one of their walks, uh, contact that, uh, uh, either that Internet uh, or the phone number. I also want to say that a few programs ago, I suggested that if anybody was will, wanted to give to the um, Beardsley and Memorial Hospital quest for a new uh, machine for their micro uh, film equipment, um, that uh, you could contact them and uh, drop off a check down there and uh, or pick up a, a document which tell you more about what they're trying to achieve. And um, they are getting there. This is the barometer. They're now halfway to their goal. They're up to about 4,550 as of a week, in a week or so. The Friends of the Library have helped them quite a bit with book sales and donations and things. There were a couple articles in newspapers as well about this, so uh, if anybody uh, uh, read those, uh, some of those people sent in money too. But if you want to send money in, just contact the Beardsley and Memorial Library and uh, talk to them and, and donate. And I'll show this from time to time as we progress. The red line's now right about up to here, once they put in the 300 that uh, they're going to be getting next week, and then they have to get up to 8,500. So they're better than halfway towards their goal. Uh, the existing machine now just about doesn't work, and uh, they have a lot of good information for that microfilm machine. So now we'll get back to the, uh, the correction I was going to go over. Now I'll first finish the agenda. Hold on. We're back to the agenda. So I'm going to talk about the penguin plunge because I did make a mistake last week and I want to correct that this week. Um, uh, we're going to talk about a bit about the Fed, the Treasury, Congress, and the state information, what's happening here in this uh, recession and what, what kind of progress did they make over the week, where we headed. I won't 
talk too much about that tonight unless I have more time. And then I want to talk a, a lot more about the town and what I what I labeled here as three it, truths uh, brought to light by this recession. Um, so there are some truths that were brought to light by the recession, and I want to talk quite a bit about those and a little, little bit of planning for success there uh, tonight. And then a definition from the town charter. There's often confusion about how you know how the town manager should be recruited, what what kind of an education you should have, and I just want to read it from the charter. Uh, what we need to look for when we look for a town manager, because in my view, the town manager is doing a wonderful job. You'll see his picture up here later in the program, and uh, you know we want to make sure everybody understands exactly what the facts are. And you can always go down, of course, and get the charter and read it for yourself. But most people don't do that, so I'll just go over here tonight. Now, for the correction, last week uh, the Penguin Pudge. Uh, I said it had raised $50 million, and uh, of course, I, I didn't, uh, didn't raise $50 million, but it did raise $50,000. So, playing your project raised $50,000. I got several phone calls about this during the week. I'm glad to hear that because people at least know, they know they're watching the program. And uh, not $50 million, as I mistakenly stated last week. Still a very positive contribution for these times. During a recession, to bring in fifty thousand dollars, which is more than half, it might be more than that. Now I didn't get a chance to contact the organizers, but that's uh, more than half of what they had last year during great times. So I think they did very well. My guess is this is probably up higher than fifty thousand this week, and if I find out, I'll let you know next week. Lately, we are used to dealing in trillions on this program, billions, and it gets confusing. And you're probably all wondering what comes after trillion, as I wondered uh, for a while. Well, next it will be quadrillions. And here's the number right here. That's one quadrillion. Comes after we get 999 trillion. So I wrote this down just so you could put things in perspective. Quadrillion, trillion, billion, million, thousand, and the minimum wage in the state of Connecticut is $8 an hour. Different probably in other states, but that's kind of interesting. Now, we're not going to get to quadrillion in my lifetime, perhaps yours or your grandchildren's, but I should, just wanted to say to you, we have to get to 999 trillion before we hit the quadrillion. That's not likely to happen, <laughs> uh, but you never know. Okay, now I want to talk a bit about the Fed, because what I'm trying to do with this program is relate what's happening at the uh, world, uh, uh, United States, and uh, in Connecticut level. That may affect our budget for the next fiscal year. And remember, the fis our budget for the next fiscal year is, is uh, um, the objective is to have a zero increase to the taxpayers and um, to have it in by March 15th to the selectmen so they can begin begin the process of um, going through the budget with the residents and with the managers and with the Board of Education and then putting it forward to our annual town budget meeting, uh, first annual town budget meeting for this year. And then uh, once, it's, uh, once it's agreed there, it can be reduced there but not increased. Then it'll move on to the town budget referendum for uh, 2009-2010 budget, and it will be approved or not. If not approved, it'll be back for rework by the town, and then go through that same loop again. So that's why I talk about these here, because we may be getting money uh, from uh, other sources this year, more money or less money um, during these tough times. So the Fed is still proceeding with our quantitative easing policy, and since September. They put about uh, 700 billion into this economy, and that's loaning money, that's uh, buying bonds when necessary, that's uh, loaning money to commercial operations through the federal discount window, and things like that. There's a whole list of things they can do, and then if they need to do more, they can even go to ask for more from Congress and the president uh, if they need to do more than than, uh, than are already approved uh, to do. So. I say, watch the Fed. The Fed is the most important thing, in my view, in getting us out of this recession. The other things that people are doing may help, may not help. Uh, 
could make things worse, could make things a little better. This is not the program to argue that on. There are people on television 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, arguing each side of these questions. But uh, the Fed is, is, uh, is still working. They're still easing the money, and it's going up fast. The money they've put out since September, plus the normal money for last year, will be over a trillion dollars. Now, a lot of that Fed money we get back again over time. Most of it's done as loans or buying bonds and things like that. So over time, uh, we will get it. It's not giving the money away, as far as I understand it. So the cost estimate since uh, September is about six or seven hundred billion that we've uh, done. Before that, it was about five hundred or six hundred billion. So we're up over a trillion there, and eventually we're going to be a trillion plus. One trillion plus. That's a trillion right there. Congress. This week, they put out some information about the job and stimulus packages. The stimulus package was approved and, and signed off a couple days ago by the president. It's about one trillion two hundred and fifty uh, billion when you include the interest. So if you take their eight hundred and seven eight seven or what it was and add on three fifty to it, you're up around this number. And that's how much it's going to cost. You notice how they never like, it's like our old bond package. Nobody ever likes to say how much the interest is going to be because it makes the number a lot bigger. They'd probably like rather see 878, 8, $8,787 billion on there rather than $1.25 trillion. So that's sort of a gimmick that uh, they use in government and not in business but in government. Uh, they, they want you to know that. And I'll bet you, even on your own mortgage, most people don't know how much they're paying in interest and how much they're paying in principal altogether over the 30 years. Most people don't know what that is because they never bothered to figure it out. Nobody really, no salesman was anxious to tell them that. This was voted on, the stimulus package, over party lines. The president likes to call it a job package. Other people like to call it a different package, but uh, the name changes from time to time, depending on the politics of the situation. Um, and it's a very controversial policy. There are those who say it won't do any good at all, it'll do a lot of harm. There are, there, there are those, those that say it'll do good and harm, and there's those that say it'll do good, and uh, as long as we watch it, something has happened here, nothing we can do about it now, but monitor it, watch it, and encourage change when necessary if it's not achieving the, the goals that it's supposed to achieve. And it's very difficult to measure those goals because, first of all, they're not properly written down. Second of all, um, they're, they're very, it's confusing about what, makes, uh, what it takes to reach a goal, and uh, that's going to be argued for the kingdom come, I think. As far as the Treasury is concerned, the TARP won. There's still some remainder to that TARP, which is being committed out for various things like uh, to the car auto industry and to banks. And then there's TARP 2, which is mainly supposed to be used for what, you, what they used to call the, uh, the bad bank um, approach, getting the toxic, toxic acids off of the books of the banks. Uh, and then the auto industry needs to be bailed out. That number keeps changing. Um, for example, last week, uh, Last week, uh, Geithner came in and he said they might need $50 billion for, uh, for the mortgage bailout. Well, this year, week, they came back and said they need $75 billion. $25 billion more, 50% increase in over what they said one week ago. Right? Now, part of that's because they didn't really have solid plans, they weren't ready to commit, things like that. Now, that, so most people think that all this here is going to end up at one point, one or two trillion before it's done. And that's just from what I hear on uh, TV and reading the news, all kinds of various opinions on it. But by the time we get the banks and this auto industry squared away, we, the taxpayers, may invest about one or two trillion dollars. We may get some of it back, we may not. But stay tuned there on TV and in the newspapers to see what happens over the next month or two on this. And that thing should at least settle down. We should know roughly what they're trying to achieve. And then they can, we can begin to measure the progress, if practical, and uh, be able to tell. But in, in meanwhile, of course, uh, we have to watch inflation. And uh, 
that's very important. Most of the things the Fed are doing are trying to avoid drastic deflation. Last the other night, I think last night I saw Alan Greenspan on TV for the first time ever. He was talking to a group in New York of economists, but uh, he's been awful low key here since this problem, and uh, we haven't seen too much of him. <laughs> so more details on the financial industry toxic assets plan, which a lot of people think is the key to the solution of this recession problem. It will eventually sort itself out over time. Could be rocky, but with the Fed and uh, pump, uh, pumping the money in and with, uh, with um, business working as usual, laying off people, cutting inventories, doing this, doing that, selling parts of their company, we will eventually get out of this recession. We just don't know when going to take a long, long time, and uh, nobody has confidence now in anything. So they're not spending, and they won't spend until they begin to get a little confidence in things. So more details on the financial industry to toxic assets plan now are now emerging. They're very controversial, and the cost, as I said, is ex expected over time to be trillions. Now, the state of Connecticut, just a bit this week, on the state of Connecticut, the tax increase, which Governor Rell has been saying she would try to avoid a tax increase at any cost. Well, the Democrats are now saying, well, we'd rather have the tax in taxes increase than the services decrease. So this is a very interesting uh, situation because the Democrats want to avoid cutting services. My own view, a lot of the services should be cut, should be reduced. For example, um, when the uh, state uh, was pushing for gambling and for having uh, 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 lotteries and for having the Mohegan uh, gambling places in Connecticut, they always cited all the tax money that was going to come in from, from that to, to help back up these services we're talking about. So we went in and put in more services. Well, that wasn't the only reason, by the way. We're also getting a lot of money in <laughs> and taxes from people who are making a lot of money in the uh, boom. And uh, now, guess what? Mohegan Suns for sure, and perhaps the lottery as well, not bringing in as much money anymore. Therefore, they're not paying as much taxes as they used to. I'm sure the Mohegan Sun and other gambling places are laying people off now, and their business is much less than it used to be. So the cost of all the services that were put into Connecticut, based upon that money coming in from people's prosperity in New York City and people's prosperity around Connecticut and people's prosperity from all the gambling and lottery uh, uh, receipts, um, that's gone. So either the services have to be cut or we have to increase the taxes on most people in Connecticut, almost everybody. <laughs> so that's being looked at now. I don't know what will happen. If the taxes, uh, if the services aren't cut, the taxes will be necessary because the, the state must, they can't spend more than they make each year. So once the Obama money gets uh, figured out what they're going to get from the stimulus package and they get squared away with all the states, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the cities and towns of what they're going to get from the stimulus packages and what's going to stay at the state level and what's going to come down to the towns. And once all this is squared away and once the state figures out what it needs, what it can give to the towns and cities, what, what it must keep for itself, what it can cut out, what tax increases will be needed, um, that's going to be another month or two, I would say. I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Now, the state has formed a committee which I'll talk about in a minute, I guess. We're up to this. Town has received notice of about $186,500 in grant reductions. We already, that was announced at this week's selectman's meeting by the town manager, Keith J. Robbins. The state subcommittee evaluating distribution of congressional stimulus money to towns and cities has been set up by the, uh, by the governor. So there is a subcommittee. And I think they asked for something like, I don't know, $10 billion and they got maybe $4 billion. I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but they probably asked for three times more than they're getting. So that has to be divided up, parceled out, and uh, 
and then we'll know. So over the next uh, couple months, we'll be knowing what we're getting from the feds, what we're getting from the state, and uh, we'll know a little bit about how the economy is going, although there's not going to be much improvement in that over the next few months. And then we'll have the uh, budgets from uh, the Board of Education for Winstead and from the town for Winstead. We'll be able to, to boil it all down and see exactly where we stand. But don't uh, think we might not be getting some more taxes. We were hoping so, but we might get more state taxes. Whenever we get more state taxes, that puts pressure on local people not to vote for local taxes. So um, it's not a win-win situation here. Um, there are some good points about getting money from elsewhere, and there are some bad points about it, which we can't go in here and take us all uh, program to talk about it, if not uh, all year. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the name of the program, <laughs> which is Planning for Success. When money is scarce, certain truths do surface that wouldn't normally in the inevitable quest for more money. You know, I knew, once knew an engineer. He was a very good engineer. He had worked with Henry Ford as a child out in Detroit, Michigan. He actually worked and learned from Henry Ford, stood over his lathe and showed him how to do things. This guy was a draftsman and a mechanical engineer, and uh, he's still alive to this day, and he knew Henry Ford. And he told me, he said, Brian, when you, if you get children around a dinner table and you put out all the courses at one time, they will reach for the dessert first. And um, I, that, uh, that stuck with me all my life because it sure is true. So what happens here is when it's budget time, nobody asks for less money. It never happens. They always ask for more money. They have to be forced, pressured, cajoled, uh, and shamed and everything into asking for less money. It happens in families as well. Uh, and it happens at all levels of government. It happens in our town, Winstead, Connecticut. Tonight I want to discuss three examples of these truths and how this economy has forced uh, them into the limelight. I'm sure that there are many, many more. I know of many more myself. But the town manager and the Board of Education need to look at this closer. But I'm going to go over three of them tonight because I think I have time uh, to do justice to these three. Number one, education. The first two examples will be from education. The third example will be from the town. A little more than a year ago, probably a year and a half ago, the last Board of Selectmen wanted to spend about $57 million that includes interest on the bonds. I think there was like $13 million in interest on the bond. That's how much they wanted to spend. About $10 million of this was to update the Pearson Middle School. And I'm not sure it was exactly $10 million. I didn't have a chance to go back and look. But it was in that neighborhood. And they wanted to use it to upgrade the Pearson Middle School. Financial times were tough then because of the revaluation and the beginning of the recession, which a lot of people felt even a year, a year and a half ago. Financial times were tough, but relatively much better than they are now in this possible longest recession since the Depression. The $57 million approach was Scott's for a more affordable approach by the majority of the new board of selectmen who ran against the large bond package approach and won the election. It wasn't the time to go for a big bond package at the beginning of a major recession. Now that money is very difficult to come by at all levels of government, a cost-saving option is being considered in the town of Winstead to perhaps move 7th and 8th grades from Pearson Middle School to the Gilbert School, which is our high school, private high school here in Winstead, and eliminate the Pearson Middle School. The reason given for eliminating the Pearson Middle School uh, uh, middle school were 
uh, by the um, superintendent of uh, schools, K through eight, was a decline in the number of students entering and exiting the school system from year to year, and the result and the resultant use of available space at Gilbert have been given as prime reasons. So what happened here is a year and a half ago, we wanted to spend 10 million or so on upgrading the Pearson School, even though then we had less students coming into the system and less students staying in the system for high school, going out and the, the high school numbers going down. That was true a year and a half ago. Yet we wanted to spend $10 million. So with this recession and this great pressure on looking at budgets, we are now saying, hey, maybe we don't even need the Pearson School. A year and a half ago, we wanted to spend $10 million on it. Now we're saying, perhaps we don't even need it because we don't have enough students, and because we don't have enough students for the foreseeable future, and most of the things I've seen on this, we're not going to have a lot of more students for quite a while, uh, and maybe never. Uh, more people are leaving the system than joining. So, um, so that's one of the truths that I see that the lack of money forces us out. Now, we shouldn't have been doing this. We should have been doing this anyway, even without a recession, because it's called good business practice a good way to run our local business. It's a good way to spend less money so the taxpayers don't have to pay more money. Now, you can always come up with reasons for more dessert, more teachers, more this, better classrooms, more science, everything else, but it has to be within the ability of the town, this poor town in Connecticut, fourth from the bottom, is able to pay. We're able to pay it. We get more development in town. We get more additional taxpayers in the town, more revenue in the town, and that wouldn't be a problem. But we have no idea when we're going to get more revenue in town. We're probably going to lose revenue in this town during the depression, recession before we get any more revenue, and we're sure not moving fast enough to get uh, permits approved and all to get this new revenue into town. So we've been working on these development, new development that's going to bring multi-millions into this town and taxes for five years and we're still not there won't be for a couple more probably before we're done so one year spending of 10 million plus or so is promoted to upgrade Pearson and the next year the Board of Education contemplates closing Pearson down uh, does that sound responsible no it doesn't we should have been thinking about closing Pearson down a year and a half ago, not asking for more money. The current recession has forced us to examine this sensible option closer. It is being examined now by a subcommittee of the Board of Education. It has been tabled for a while, uh, but it is still under consideration uh, and maybe need to be taken off the table again. So uh, it may also help with the current test score problem. We've had a problem here in town where I'm told that the Gilbert School, high school, says that the reason their test scores are down is because people aren't prepared properly. The children aren't, uh, and young adults, aren't prepared properly when they enter into their school. So if we were to take the 7th and 8th grades and move them to Gilbert and let Gilbert get involved in the training of these people in the 7th and 8th grade, even if it's only part of their training there, maybe they have to share it with the teachers from the K through 8, then they can make sure that people are prepared when they get into the high school. So to a certain extent, we'd be winning. It's a win-win situation. they got more room at Gilbert because they have less students there. And they could um, also get involved in a 7th to 8th grade education and help get those children ready for first year of high school and get the test scores up. Then I'll have a win-win situation. And then when they get the test scores up, guess what? More people won't go to other schools in the state. They'll stay in cities and towns in, in the state. They'll come here. They'll stay at Gilbert. Because I always tell people when I was traveling the world, I wanted my children to be in very good schools, even though I didn't appreciate schools when I was young myself. I was a bit of a hellraiser, but 
I got through them and I got through college and uh, I've always thought it was very important for my children to at least have the opportunity to go on to higher education and uh, they all did but uh, uh, so I made sure I lived in towns where the education was top-notch and I traveled an hour or two hours to work every day or more so they could be in good school well that's the same thing that happens here people want to go to good schools they're gonna put their kids in good schools if they think that uh, St. Anthony's or St. Joseph's I can never remember the name of that is better than our K through 8 that's where they're gonna put them they think that uh, they can go down to St. Francis in Torrington uh, uh, and that's better they're gonna pay money out of their own pocket to do that so in a sense they're paying twice they're paying their taxes so their kids can go to school here but they don't like the school year they, uh, so they send them down to some private school either in town or out of town and uh, and uh, they get to pay twice so there's a lot of pressure on getting these test scores up and getting so this this approach might help it now unfortunately this is Brian's opinion I went to a couple of the meetings I saw what was going on I read all the newspapers unfortunately it looks as though the long-lasting politics between the Board of Education and the Gilbert School Board may be getting in the way of doing the right thing. Now, all I'm trying to say here, somebody might nitpick me and say, well, there really isn't the Gilbert School Board. It's uh, something else. Well, what I'm really trying to say here is that for the good of the town, we need to have the high, high school management and the K through eight management all working together as a team to achieve a common goal which is to provide a, a, a relatively fair, fairly expensive education, and getting the test scores up, serving the kids also that don't want to go on to college but want to go on to uh, trades and, and other uh, things like that. And we should be working together as a team. And my way of constructing a team is saying, hey, you guys at the Gilbert School, you need to come down and work with K through 8. You guys at K through 8, you need to get in and work with Gilbert. No excuses. You just got to do it. There's got to be a joint team, whether you like each other or not. You might hate each other, but that isn't going to help the children in the town. And then again, you might like each other, which will make it even easier. And then once you get that agreed, and you can work between yourselves, and I'll talk about some of the reasons why in a few minutes, other reasons why besides this one, then you can invite the town in. The charter says you must invite the town in uh, to help you. Uh, in, the board, in the education. Uh, so you can invite the town manager and the mayor and the selectmen and the town, all the direct reports to the town manager, to come and join your team so that you would have a team of Gilbert, K-8 through eight Board of Education, and the town. And you have joint meetings, you work together, might even be a subcommittee, I don't know, but you know, it's got to be positive and you've you got to be very visible, you've got to let everybody see what you're doing. Now, this hasn't got anything to be do with the recession, so to speak. It's just forced out by the recession. We have to do something here. Now, if we get a bunch of money from the president and from the state, from these giveaway uh, um, deals they're putting together, that'll just prolong our agony here. But we'll be all right for another couple of years until we stop getting money from uh, the stimulus package and we stop getting money from the state. Now, some of the problems we have in the school system got nothing to do with us. They're from unfunded mandates and from arbitration we have to go through. So uh, those have to be resolved as well. But I always like to take the approach, what can we do here in our own town? What can we do? And if we jointly work the problems of the education and then we jointly go to the state, I would think we'd had a better chance. And then we could join with other towns to go to the state which the, the Litchfield County Board of Elected Officials tries to do and the CCM tries to do, but, you know, uh, that, that would even be better. So it's a positive approach to things. And what I'm saying here now is uh, this has been brought to light by this recession, and uh, we got to get it fixed. And we can postpone it, but we shouldn't postpone the planning. We should take sensible steps, not plan to spend $10 uh, um, million dollars when uh, we really should be doing taking a whole different approach so that's what I want to say about that and that's one of the, uh, the th things that's been forced out into the light by the recession another thing that's been forced out into the light by the recession is a very interesting one 
was mentioned the other night at the uh, selectman meeting is uh, again in education the board of education recently hired a finance director the fourth in as many years we had three permanent finance directors and we had one uh, temporary one in the last three years this finance director is remunerated much more than the town finance director who has been doing an excellent job here for 32 years so we've got a problem now the school people will probably say yeah but you have to have special credentials to work for the school district I talked to other people who say well that's not it's not that complex you know maybe we could get somebody we could put him under the uh, the town uh, finance director he could take the right courses get the right accreditation whatever and then work for both of us and we could save uh, 20 30 40 fifty thousand dollars a year I'm not saying that's can be done but I'm saying it should be looked into and, it, and it, it, it's very important that you know you don't want to take somebody who's been working for 32 years and then bring in somebody else on the other side uh, where they haven't even uh, put out uh, progress reports for a year and a half to the selectmen in the town and uh, you pay them that much more money and by the way the other two that were there they earned a lot of money too it isn't as though this guy's paying pay anymore now this is no combination of the new finance director and the board of Educa education side but it's a town problem that needs to be resolved and again it's been forced out by the fact that we need to get tighter on our budgets because of, the, of this recession perhaps depression that we're, we're uh, in now this is once again brought to light the tremendous wasteful administration overlap between the town and Winston school system people have been talking about this for years long before I came back here different computer systems there are three of them one for the town one for K through 8 one for Gilbert there are three purchasing departments to the best of my knowledge one for each there are two superintendents or one and a half superintendents whichever way you want to look at it the the high school one Gilbert school ones only half time or a few days a week so uh, it's one point five or whatever number it turns out to be and then other things now people in town have been pointing these out for years the recession has just brought them once again to the forefront because we have a recession we must address these problems we must work together town K through 8 Gilbert this should have always been the case and these problems should have been fixed a long time ago but the money has been passed off onto the taxpayers instead now number three the town has had a long time problem of accruing and eventually granting unused vacation and sick time to its employees this problem this has been good for the employees they, they get to save their vacation and, and their sick time and then when they leave the comp, uh, the, uh, the town corporation here for one reason or another they get paid for that so some employees have been here a long time have a few years to go to retirement they saved up a lot of money and uh, it all adds up so granting unused vacation and sick time to its employees but not reserving dollars for this time uh, that they're that they're going to give to these employees when they leave from year to year for the eventual payout when employees leave so what they should be doing is or should have been doing for many years is accruing this money reserving for it putting it in the budget having a line item in there that says um, you know here's money in here to pay out to people for sick time and vacation time when they retire or leave or whatever and uh, here's the money it's in there nobody can touch it it's like a sinking fund nobody can touch it unless it's for that purpose and that money would start to collect interest and etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so we haven't been doing that so right now if uh, all of a sudden four people uh, retire you know, we got a bit of a problem and, and uh, this problem has been known and discussed for years and not planned for by the previous town managers all say yeah we knew there was a problem uh, previous boards of selectmen but nobody ever did anything about it now that the liability has reached a large sum say one million or so we have a potential liability of one sum that we have uh, one million that we have a, 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 a reserve for and could come up at any time uh, we have about one million there um, and liability and four or five long-term employees are nearing retirement and usually long-term employees have saved up holidays and vacation days and are expecting some remuneration for that 
and we will owe them a lot of dollars that have not been planned for and we may have an urgent financial problem to deal with at a time when our general fund is relatively low. As you know from this year's budget we're using some of that money for the Pearson OCR complaints if things go according to plans and that's going to bring our uh, general fund down and uh, unless we get some more money in one way or another and I don't think uh, there's too much of a forecast for that with the recession on. The new town manager Keith Robbins backed by the new majority of selectmen is attempting to finally resolve this inherited problem in the town. So the town manager is working on it. What he's going to try to do is he's going to try to solve this problem to the best for the employees of the town and for the town so we, don't, we're not, we won't be in this pickle anymore. He's working on it uh, with the uh, labor attorneys and with others and sooner or later he'll have a draft report for the selectmen. They'll read it and they'll try to come up with an answer to this. So uh, this is just another example of things that get forced out in tough times. It's been forced out before, but nobody did anything about it. It's been forced out this time, and they are doing something about it, and hopefully it'll please everybody. You know, they don't want to uh, anybody to get gypped on this thing. It's got to be worked out in a professional manner. And uh, this is another example of, of how Keith J. Robbins is taking a bull by the horns in this town and doing an excellent job. I hear more and more about that all the time. Somebody stood up at the select meeting the other night in the public comment section and said, this guy is doing a good job. Let's figure out ways to keep him here. I'm just paraphrasing what he said. You can see it on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, Channel 13, Charter, if you want to hear it from this. And I think it was done at the second half of the meeting. Now, I just want to say a little bit about the Charter in the last couple of minutes for the town manager. There are people who say, this guy doesn't have enough education. He doesn't go on to school long enough. He doesn't have the right credentials from a, sc a scholastic viewpoint. Well, this is what it says in the Charter, Section 501. It says a bit about uh, the selectman hiring a town manager, and they say, and, the town man and who shall be chosen? The town manager shall be chosen exclusively on the basis of his executive and administrative qualifications, which this town manager, Keith J. Robbins, certainly has, his character, his education, his training, and his experience. So it doesn't say here you must have a master's degree in uh, municipal management or, or even a, a degree in municipal management. It doesn't say anything like that. It's a balance. And when I read all the charters uh, in, uh, when I was working on the Charter Revision Commission, they all said the same thing. Basically, that the experience uh, was, was, was very, very important. And if a guy had a 20, 30 years experience but not much of a college degree in that area, although he has taken college courses, that uh, that will be in his favor. So with that, I want to say thank you. It's been an interesting week. It's going to be an interesting week again. And I hope you learned a little by watching uh, my introduction on a very, very uh, helpful citizen, Franz Opper, who summered here at Highland Lake when he was in his youth all up until he went to to Hotchkiss, maybe even then, and contributed a lot to our country. And his wife, Barbara Negriopper, same thing, did a heck of a lot working with the World Bank and the SEC and other places. So let's encourage our children. I know a lot of them watch here, the high school kids. Let's encourage them to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>